So people have been commenting on every video that I post, asking me to do chronic kidney disease, asking me to do chronic liver disease, asking me to do videos on TV. Guys, I have heard. I'm going to do those videos. Just be patient. In this video, I want us to look at chronic kidney disease. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevo. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at chronic kidney disease. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. If you haven't watched the video on acute kidney injury, I will leave it tagged at the end of this particular video. I will also leave it as a pinned comment on this particular video. Please head over and watch that video first because some of the concepts won't make so much sense when you actually watch this video. So remember that the kidneys are very important because they function in the metabolic system. They're going to be helping in the process of homeostasis. They help in the process of acid-base balance. They help in the process of fluid and electrolyte balance. If they are damaged, this is going to lead invariably to different problems and ultimately death of a patient. When we talk about kidney pathologies, in terms of acute kidney injury and in terms of chronic kidney injury, your threshold is three months. So anyone having problems lasting less than three months, I've never had them before in the past, we refer to that as acute in terms of the kidney. Anyone having problems that are lasting more than three months, we refer that to as chronic. So when you talk about chronic kidney disease, they have this progressive irreversible reduction in the renal function, and this is over a period of three months. It's a gradual thing. You may define it as the following things. So if someone has a GFR that's less than 60 mils per minute per 1.7 square meters for three months, or they have a urinary albumin to creatinine ratio greater than 65 milligrams per millimole, or they have a protein creatinine ratio of 100 milligrams per millimole. There is something that's known as end-stage renal disease, which is like the last stage if you look at the classification based on the GFR, those that have a GFR less than 15. So here, this is going to be this clinical state where they have this invariably re irreversible loss of endogenous renal function, and this is going to render the patient unable to live without them depending on renal replacement therapy. And remember, renal replacement therapy, two things if you're talking about CKD. It's either there's dialysis or this person is getting a renal transplant in order for them to actually avoid these complications of uremia. Remember from our previous discussion on AKI, we say that the difference between uremia and azotemia is that uremia has symptoms, azotemia does not have any symptoms, but both have an increase in the blood urea nitrogenous wastes. Causes of CKD could be congenital or inherited, so things like polycystic kidney disease, which could be infantile or adult forms, medullary cystic disease, tuberous sclerosis, oxalosis, cystinosis, and congenital obstructive uropathies. You could have Glomerular disease, primary glomerulo, uh, nephritides, things like glo uh, focal glomerulosclerosis. You could have secondary glomerular disease, which could be in the background of SLE, polyangitis, Wagner's granulomatosis, amyloidosis, diabetic glomerulosclerosis, accelerated hypertension, hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, systemic sclerosis, and even sickle cell disease. Vascular causes could be hypertension. So hypertensive nephrosclerosis, this is the, one of the common causes. Diabetic nephropathy, another common cause. You could have some renal vascular causes, even some small and medium-sized vessel vasculitis. Or indeed, it could be a problem with the tubular interstitial disease, your tubular interstitial nephritis, which could be in the background of a reaction to some nephrotoxic analgesics, even sometimes it could be immune-mediated. TB, schistosomiasis, reflux nephropathy, nephrocalcinosis, multiple sclerosis, you have myeloma of the kidneys, you may have renal papillary necrosis, which could be in the background of diabetes, sickle cell, or even sickle cell trait, even analgesic nephropathy. Or it could be in the patient of someone taking Chinese herbs, where they develop a Chinese herb nephropathy. You can have some urinary tract obstruction, like 
calculi, merino stones, prostatic disease, pelvic tumors, retroperitoneal fibrosis, even schistosomiasis. All these things could potentially lead to chronic kidney disease. In our setup here, the most common causes are due to hypertension as well as diabetes. So how do we classify a patient having chronic kidney disease? So we can use the GFR divided into five stages. Stage one, if they have a GFR greater than 90, these patients will have no impairment. They may have normal or even increased GFR with evidence of some kidney damage. Then 60 to 89, that's stage two, they have mild impairment. They have this slightly decrease in GFR with other evidence of a kidney damage. Then class three are divided into 3A and 3B. 3A is between 45 to 59, 3B is between 30 to 44. Here they have moderate impairment, they have moderately decreased in the GFR with or without evidence of kidney damage. Then someone with uh, a GFR of 15 to 29, they have severe impairment, they severely decrease GFR with or without evidence of kidney damage. And if they have a GFR less than 15, like I told you, this is end stage kidney disease, they need some renal replacement therapy for them to survive. Remember that those that are with stage one and stage two are going to require or rather require the presence of kidney damage for you to actually make a diagnosis that this is stage one CKD. So there should be some persistent proteinuria or maybe some unexplained hematuria or some structural disease or some glomerulonephritis. Then we often add a, a, pre, a suffix rather of B whenever we are noticing that in this particular stage, the significant proteinuria. So a urine albumin creatinine ratio greater than 65 or a protein creatinine ratio greater than 100. So remember, the kidneys are not working. GFR is reduced. You're not removing those nitrogenous wastes. Those nitrogenous wastes are going to be accumulating in the bloodstream. Remember that these are going to be coming from pretty much metabolism of proteins and amino acids. Unlike we see with carbohydrates, carbohydrates are going to be, even fats are going to be metabolized into carbon dioxide, which is pushed out from the lungs, and water, which also is pushed out from the lungs, and to some extent even can be pushed out in the GIT. And the byproducts of this protein metabolism are going to produce this non-volatile organic acids which are going to accumulate in the blood. And once you have this accumulation of the nitrogenous waste in the bloodstream, then this is going to be because of a, a decrease in the renal function and a reduction in the catabolism capacity of the kidneys. Then they'll develop these characteristic signs and symptoms of chronic kidney disease. What are some of these symptoms? Remember that in the early stages, the patients may actually even be asymptomatic. So there is a rough correlation between the urea and creatinine concentrations as well as the symptoms. So often you get symptoms being common when the levels of urea have actually exceeded 40. So your patients are going to develop uremic sim symptoms, which could be things like insomnia, uh, symptoms that may be related to salt and water retention. They may have peripheral or pulmonary edema. They may have symptoms due to anemia because the kidneys is very important, especially in the process of erythropoiesis. I'll talk about it later on. They may have loss of appetite, malaise, loss of energy, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, nocturia, polyuria, which is due to impaired concentration ability of the kidneys. They may have amenorrhea in women, erectile dysfunction in men, itching, paresthesia, which may be due to polyneuropathy, a restless leg syndrome where they have this overwhelming feeling that they need to alter their position of their lower limbs. They may have bone pain, which may be due to metabolic bone disease, which is one of the complications of chronic kidney disease. In the more advanced stages, those that have stage 5 CKD, they actually symptoms become quite severe. They may have mental slowing, clouding of the consciousness, they may develop seizures, they may have myoclonic twitching. And remember that once you get this severe depression of the GFR. Patients may actually have oliguria. And this is quite common in patients that have AKI. It's quite common in patients that have end-stage renal disease. But those that are in between, because the GFR has been decreased for a very long time, the kidneys have been injured, there's going to be a reduction in tubular reabsorption function of the kidneys. The kidneys are no longer able to reabsorb even the little or the filtrate that is pushed out in these injured kidneys. So these patients may actually produce high volumes of urine. This is a very high yield point to actually remember. And such that to the point that urine output is actually not a useful 
guide of renal function, especially in patients that have CKD. In patients with AKI, it may be a good guide, but in those that have CKD, not really a good guide to judge renal function. So some signs may be related to uremia, and these are some of the few physical signs. So you may have uh, patients that have a short stature in, in general or short status in patients that have CKD, especially in uh, childhood, that's started off in childhood. They may have pallor that is due to the anemia, they may have increase in photosensitive pigmentation, so which may make the patient actually look like as if they're healthy, but they're not really healthy. They may have brownish discoloration of the nails, scratch marks that are due to uremic pruritus, they may have signs of fluid overload, they may have a pericardial rub. Remember, this pericardial rub is very important. You hear this, it's most likely this patient has a uremia, most likely your patient may need dialysis. They may, have, they may have a flow murmur, it could be a mitral regurgitation, which is due to mitral annular calcifications, aortic and pulmonary regurgitation murmurs, which are due to fluid overload. They may have glove and stock a peripheral sensory loss where the entire hand and the feet, they have this numbness and this sensory loss, and the kidneys are usually impalpable, unless if they're grossly enlarged. The only time when you ever get a CKD when the kidneys are actually enlarged in conditions like polycystic kidney disease, obstructive pathologies, even tumors of, that are affecting the kidneys. But otherwise, your kidneys and CKD are going to be small. Then in addition to these particular findings, there may be other features that are pointing towards the underlying disease. So things like cutaneous vasculitic uh, lesions in terms of systemic vasculitides, you may have renal uh, retinopathy in, in terms of diabetes and hypertension, you may have evidence of peripheral vascular disease, that may be associated with renal artery stenosis. You may have evidence of spina bifida or other neurogenic or other causes of neurogenic bladder. So here's a picture to show you the different signs and symptoms of chronic kidney disease. So you can actually pause the video, take a screenshot. Most of these I've actually talked about. Now what complications do we expect to see in patients with CKD? So you, they may have CNS abnormalities, confusion, comas, fits, or seizures, this is usually pointing towards severe uremia. They may have cardiovascular complications like pericarditis. Remember that these toxins that are accumulating are the ones that are responsible for uh, causing the inflammation of the pericardium. So remember that the finding of a multi-component friction rub strongly is going to be supporting the diagnosis. They may have a pericardial effusion, which is often hemorrhagic. They may have hypertension, very common in end-stage renal disease. And this type of hypertension is quite difficult to actually treat and it may result from fluid overload. So sometimes it may actually be quite severe. They may have congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema because of this volume overload, because of this increase in pulmonary capillary permeability and even peripheral vascular disease. You may have some hematological abnormalities and I want to take my time to actually explain this. So patients that have chronic kidney disease, one of the markers that can help you actually distinguish whether this is an acute or a chronic disease is anemia though not always. So you may have a normocytic, normochromic type of anemia where they have an HP that's roughly between four to six. This is very important because the kidneys function in erythropoiesis. So the kidneys are responsible for production of a hormone from the peritubular interstitial cells that's known as erythropoietin. Remember erythropoietin is very important in the process of synthesis of red blood cells because it helps in the differentiation of red blood cells it helps in the release of the reticulocytes from the bone marrow. It also helps in the maturation of the reticulocytes. So there's a decrease in the production of erythropoietin in these patients because they have CKD. So in the management of anemia that is due to CKD, obviously you want to give these patients erythropoietin. The kidneys are also going to be excreting some of the toxins from the body. And remember that if these kidneys are not functioning, these toxins are not being secreted. And some of these toxins can actually cause suppression of the bone marrow function. If the bone marrow function is being suppressed, this results in reduction in the synthesis of red blood cells. Then in addition to this, there may be some fibrosis in the bone marrow that may be due to high hyperparathyroidism. Sometimes they may have some deficiencies in iron, deficiencies in vitamin B12, deficiencies in folate. And remember that often uremia is also associated with some sort of uremic bleeds, some sort of platelet dysfunction. So they may have some blood loss, which could be a coat coming from the GIT, even from these repetitive blood samples that you're drawing. Sometimes the blood loss can be occurring during the process of hemodialysis. 
or maybe because of the platelet dysfunction that may be associated with uremia. Patients with chronic kidney disease have their lifespan of their red blood cells reduced and there is increase in red blood cell destruction. The red blood cells that are formed have an abnormal red cell membrane that makes them osmotically fragile and can easily be actually ruptured. In addition to this, the ACE inhibitors may cause anemia and CKD, probably we think because it actually affects the endogenous release of erythropoietin. So the red cell survival is actually reduced greatly in patients with CKD and because you get this increase in destruction that may occur even during hemolysis or rather during hemodialysis you also get it because of it may be the, the red blood cells are being mechanically broken down there may be some un oxidants rather there may be some thermal damage to these red blood cells these patients tend to develop normocytic normochromic type of anemia patients may have bleeding tendencies which are attributed to the platelet dysfunction so they may have they manifest with bleeding or easy bruisability, they may have GIT bleeding, they may have intracranial hemorrhage. There is susceptibility to infections, so there is a change in the leukocyte formation and the function. There may be lymphocytopenia and atrophy of the lymphoid tissues. In the GIT, you often get to see decrease in gastric emptying. You may have an increased risk of reflux esophagitis, peptic ulceration, acute pancreatitis, GIT bleeding, and even constipation. Fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base balances are very important because these are what are going to kill your patients acutely, especially those that have a chronic kidney disease. So you may have volume expansion and contractions, you may have edema, in some patients you may have dehydration. So remember that the expansion of the volume is because it's an isotonic expansion and the patients are usually normal natremic, so they'll have a normal levels of sodium and they'll have high volumes of this isotonic fluid. Sometimes you may get hyponatremia in these patients, but this will be in the background of this patient ingesting excess amounts of water, causing a dilutional type of uh, hyponatremia because they can't get rid of that excess water. Their kidneys are not working. So remember that these patients that have chronic renal failure have impaired mechanisms that are meant to help conserve the sodium, that are meant to help conserve the water. So when you get an extra renal cause for fluid loss that is present, for example, vomiting, for example, diarrhea, for example, sweating, for example, fever. These patients cannot reabsorb the sodium and the water from the kidneys because these mechanisms have been impaired. So they end up going into volume depletion. They end up going into dehydration. So it's possible to have edema. It's also possible to have dehydration in this patient. So if they take a lot of sodium, for example, they'll retain a lot of water. And this will lead to things like congestive heart failure. This will lead to things like peripheral edema, things like ascites which is why we often tend to restrict the salt in their diet. Potassium metabolism is also quite affected in these patients. And remember that abnormalities in potassium could kill you. I did videos on hyper and hypokalemia. You can check those up in the emergency medicine playlist. And remember that these patients tend to have hyperkalemia, especially if their GFR falls below 10. It may be due to exogenous factors like hemolysis, trauma, or even infections that are killing off Red blood cells, remember cells that are being killed off are releasing their potassium into the bloodstream. Or maybe it could be exogenous factors. This patient received blood that was stored for some time. Maybe some potassium-containing medications were given to this patient. Maybe it's a potassium-containing dietary salt substitute. So these are going to be contributing to hyperkalemia. Acidosis also is going to be seen. So this may facilitate the potassium moving from the intracellular space into the extracellular space so that you can get that hydrogen ions into the cells and to buffer the acidosis. Drugs like potassium sparing diuretics and even ACE inhibitors can also contribute to potassium abnormalities. Metabolic acidosis is seen, it's much more common in advancing stages and usually the total amount of the urinary net daily acid excretion is usually markedly reduced in patients with CKD. Another important thing to take note of that may help you even distinguish between an acute kidney disease and a chronic kidney disease is the renal osteodystrophy and the metabolic bone disease. You rarely are going to see this in acute kidney disease, but you're going to see this in chronic kidney disease. So this is because there is abnormalities in the metabolism of phosphate as well as calcium. Remember that patients that have advanced renal failure, they're going to be having hyperphosphatemia. And remember that the serum concentrations of phosphate are going to increase when patients have a GFR less than 20.
The amount of calcium in the bloodstream is significantly lower than normal, and these patients can actually tolerate the hypocalcemia surprisingly quite well. And rarely the patients will actually become symptomatic because of the decrease in the concentrations of calcium. Remember that the low calcium concentration is because these patients have a secondary hyperparathyroidism. They may also have a reduction in the synthesis of vitamin D and the activation of vitamin D which happens inside the kidneys and it is thought that this actually has a role in the synthesis or the onset of the hyperparathyroidism and of course the effects that we see on calcium. And remember that the active vitamin D metabolite is normally produced in the proximal tubule. It's produced in the kidneys. So both these are going to be directly causing and are thought to actually cause the hypocalcemia. You may have some bone abnormalities like rickets, which may they may have some osteomalacia, they may have osteosclerosis, where they have this enhanced bone densities in the upper and lower margins of the vertebra. They may have osteitis fibrosa cystica, where they have this osteoclastic reabsorption of the bone because they have this hypocalcemia and they have the parathyroid hormone inside the system so they tend to resorb the bone and then this may be evident in the terminal phalanges in the long bones it may also be seen in the distal ends of the clavicle so here's a flow chart to help you see how this bone renal bone disease is actually happening so remember that in the kidneys there is activation of vitamin d 1,25 hydroxycholecalciferol. So this activation doesn't happen. So if this activation doesn't happen, it means bones are going to be mineralized. Calcium absorption is going to be reduced because vitamin D is needed for the absorption of calcium. There's going to be an increase in alkaline phosphatase. Remember that alkaline phosphatase also comes from the bone, a decrease in calcium and an increase in phosphate levels. These are contributing to osteomalacia. In addition to this, this active compound of vitamin D is not also present. So there's a decrease in calcium, there's an increase in phosphate. This results in the reduction, in the increase in the production of parathyroid hormone. There's a hyperparathyroidism. So this is what is, leads to a secondary hyperparathyroidism and in the long run, a tertiary hyperparathyroidism and osteosclerosis. Remember that in patients with chronic kidney disease, there's a low bone turnover, so there's decrease in remodeling and decrease in bone formation. So we can actually, uh, calcitrol can be prescribed for those that have low calcium. So these patients may or may not have increase in levels of calcium, they may have normal ALP levels. The parathyroid hormone is going to be reduced, so these patients have what is known as adynamic bone disease. You may sometimes have some iatrogenic causes, for example, a patient that has CKD is taking steroids, or maybe after a transplant. So here there's going to be a progression from high turnover of the bones to low turnover of the bones. So this can actually uh, lead to osteoporosis. All these things are contributing to osteopenia where you may have pseudo fractures, you may have subperiosteal erosions, pepper pot skull, even a ragged jersey spine in these patients on the radiological features. Other complications, you may have some malignancies. Remember that the incidence actually increases in patients that are have CKD and in those that are with dialysis. So there is malignant changes that can occur in multicystic kidney disease. You may have lymphomas, you may have primary cancers of the liver, you may have thyroid cancers that may occur. In the endocrine system, they may have hypogonadism. Remember that the, there is a decrease in the plasma testosterone levels. This may contribute to the erectile dysfunction, there is impotence, there is oligospermia. In women, they may have olig oligomenorrhea or even amenorrhea. They may have inability to carry pregnancies to term. They may have hyperprolactinemia, which may cause uh, galactoria in both males and females. This inappropriate of expression of milk from the breast. They may have increase in levels of luteinizing hormone in children. They have impaired growth hormone secretion, so most of them may have a short stature. They may have abnormal thyroid uh, hormone levels. That's partly because there's an altered protein binding mechanism and the measurement of TSH is actually the best way to actually assess thyroid function. So true hypothyroidism is going to occur with increased frequency in patients that actually have CKD. They may have posterior pituitary gland that may be functioning normally in patients with CKD. They may have metabolic abnormalities, so they may develop gout or have exacerbations of gout because they are retaining this urate. They are not excreting it from the kidneys, but remember that Treatment now is a bit tricky because we want to avoid NSAIDs because NSAIDs are nephrotoxic. So generally colchicine is useful for acute attacks and allopurinol should be introduced under colchicine to prevent any further attacks. It's a bit contraindicated for you to give them NSAIDs.
and the dose of allopurinol should be reduced, especially in patients with CKD. For example, you can, you can give them 100 milligrams on alternate days. Remember that insulin is going to be cata catabolized and by some extent is also going to be excreted from the kidneys because the kidneys are also important in regulation of glucose. So the demands in a diabetic patient are going to decrease in a patient that has CKD. So you must make sure that you look at their insulin regimen to see that they're not becoming hypoglycemia or rather hypoglycemic. So by contrast, the end organ resistance to insulin is actually even a feature of advanced CKD. So some people have modest impairment in glucose tolerance and even insulin resistance that may also contribute to the hypertension and the lipid abnormalities. They may have some lipid metabolism abnormalities, so you want to correct these by giving them the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. Those are, those are the statins, especially in patients with CKD, though clinical data um, is not really so good on this. Remember, they, they have impaired clearance of the triglyceride-rich particles and they have hypercholesterolemia, which may predispose them to coronary heart disease, especially in patients with CKD. You may have some dermatological abnormalities like pala, which may be due to anemia, ecchymosis, hematoma because of the platelet dysfunction, preterous and excoriations because they are retaining this nitrogenous waste um, from the protein metabolism. They are retaining this phosphate. They have the secondary hyperparathyroidism. All this can lead to calcium deposits and deposits of some of these nitrogenous wastes in the skin that can cause irritation in them to scratch. They may have yellowish discoloration of the skin because of the deposition of the urochromes. They may have a uremic frost, which is seen usually on the forehead. Remember that this is because you have a very high concentration of urea in the sweat. So when the water component actually evaporates, it leaves behind this fine white powder and you can actually see it on the surface of the skin. You may actually see it on the face. This is a uremic frost. You may have a nephrogenic systemic fibrosis due to gadolinium uh, contrast agents which are excreted exclusively by the kidneys. Now what's our diagnostic approach? We want to do a history, we want to perform a physical examination, we also want to distinguish whether this is an acute kidney injury or a chronic kidney disease. Then of course we want to order for certain investigations and manage our patients accordingly. So in our history we want to ask for the duration of the symptoms. Remember this is going to be above three months. Ask if they're taking any drugs including NSAIDs, analgesics, other medications or even an orthodox treatment like Chinese herbal remedies or just these other herbal medications. Past medical history of any previous chemo, multisystemic diseases like SLE, malaria, history of hypertension, diabetes, which are two common causes of CKD in our setup, systemic uh, infections or even inflammatory disease, metabolic diseases. You want to ask the pre the, on previous occasion if they had a urinalysis or if they have had any readings of creatinine or urea that may have been done before. It could be for maybe they did some tests before they got into employment, maybe it's for an insurance company or maybe just a, a patient checkup. You want to actually look at those to see and compare those results to what you're going to be taking now. And of course, ask them for a family history of renal disease. When you examine these patients, it's very important to do the following things. You want to do a blood pressure measurement perform a fundoscopy, a precordial examination, you want to examine the abdomen for any bruits or any palpable renal masses, you want to examine the extremities for any edema, perform a neurologic examination which may show you the presence of asterixis or metabolic flap, a muscle weakness, or even neuropathies. In addition, you want to also evaluate the size of the prostate in men and evaluate for potential pelvic masses in women, so you should undertake appropriate examinations for these following things. So how do we distinguish between acute and chronic renal failure? Number one, of course, your time frame. These patients may have long-standing nocturia and pruritus. This problem would have been there persisting beyond three months. Number two, the kidney size. The kidney size is often a reliable sign that you can actually use on ultrasound to determine whether this is an acute process or it's a chronic process. So generally, if your kidneys are small, Remember that when you do your ultrasound and you demonstrate the kidney size and you see, realize that they are small, maybe they are less than 8 centimeters in length, then usually this is pointing you towards chronic renal disease. Remember that in patients that have polycystic kidney disease and those pathologies I mentioned earlier on, they're going to have large kidneys. So they may have CKD with large kidneys. There are exceptions to this. It's not a rule that is set in stone. Then in contrast, if your kidneys are actually large, more than 10 centimeters, again, 
this could be a renal injury that is most likely acute in nature and has a potentially reversible cause. So put all this in clinical context and actually match it with the history and your physical examination findings. You may sometimes find broad tubular casts on the urine. You may sometimes see anemia in chronic renal disease, but not always. You may sometimes also find some renal osteodystrophy or the bone metabolic, or metabolic renal metabolic bone disease. These features usually are going to be pointing you that this patient is most likely having a chronic pathology and not having an acute pathology. So you want to identify any aggravating factors, whether it's an acute or chronic, but sometimes you may even have an acute on chronic presentation. So things like hypovolemia or hypotension, hypertension, congestive heart failure, sepsis, nephrotoxins. You want to evaluate for reversible uh, underlying etiologies like malignant hypertension, obstructive uropathy, systemic lupus erythematosus, because these things can be potentially managed and you can actually limit the progress of the disease. Investigations that we're going to do, you want to do a urinalysis. If you see hematuria, this may be pointing you towards glomerulonephritis, but you may also have other causes still need to be excluded. Remember that hematuria should not be assumed due to the presence of an indwelling catheter. As, assess this patient further, investigate this patient further. You may see proteinuria, which is usually suggestive of glomerular disease. Sometimes even urinary infections can cause proteinuria. You may see uh, glycosuria with a normal blood glucose. This is very common in patients with CKD. You may see, urine, when you do your urine couches, get your early morning samples. You also want to check for TB get your urine microscopy. If you see your white blood cells, usually it's indicative of an infection, a bacterial infection, but this is actually uncommon in CKD patients. So they may have a sterile pyuria, which often is going to be suggesting that this patient may either have a renal TB or they may have a papillary necrosis. You may see eosinophil urea, eosinophils, and especially allergic tubular interstitial nephritis. I think I alluded to this when we looked at AKI. Or cholesterol embolism. You may see some casts, so some granular casts can be formed because these abnormal cells are dying off, they're shedding off, they're falling into the lumen, and this is usually indicative of active renal disease. Red cell casts are highly suggestive of glomerulonephritis, and the red cells in the urine may be coming from anywhere from the glomerulus to the urethromiatus. Urine biochemistry and those urine electrolytes are not so helpful in patients with CKD, the urine osmolality, which is a measure of the ability to concentrate urine. So a low urine osmolality is normal in the presence of high fluid intake in the patient, but indicates renal disease when the kidneys should be concentrating the urine, such as in patients with hypovolemia or those that are hypotensive. You want to do some blood investigations, urea and creatinine. Remember that serial measurements are going to help you to determine the severity and the chronicity. You want to calculate your estimated GFR. You want to do your full blood count. Eosinophilia can suggest maybe it's a vasculitis or an allergic tubular interstitial nephritis or cholesterol embolism. So fragmented red blood cells and even thrombocytopenia can actually suggest intravascular hemolysis, which is due to accelerated hypertension. It may be due to hemolytic uremic syndrome, and it may be due to thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. You can actually distinguish between some of these causes on peripheral blood smear. You may see what are known as Heinz bodies. I want you to look up Heinz bodies, H-E-I-N-Z. Then you do an ESR where there's going to be a marked raise in viscosity. And of course, this may suggest myeloma or even a vasculitis. You test for other things like sickle cell disease, hepatitis B, which could be associated with polyarthritis or maybe membranous nephropathy, hepatitis C, which could be cryoglobulinemic renal disease, HIV, which may cause HIV-associated renal disease. You want to do antibodies against the streptococcal antigen. Maybe this is a post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. You want to screen for SLE, scleroderma, Wegener's granulomatosis, microscopic polyangitis, even good pasture syndrome. You want to do your imaging, your ultrasound. Remember, this is going to verify that the kidneys are symmetrical and give you an estimate of the kidney size. Trule out any masses and even any obstructive Uropathies, symmetrically small kidneys, usually suggestive of chronic kidney disease. And this is because there is some scarring and the kidneys are shrinking. So normal sized kidneys, they could suggest an acute rather than a chronic process, but you may get some diseases like I told you, where you have a normal or sometimes even an enlarged kidney, even in the presence of CKD. So diseases like amyloidosis, polycystic kidney disease, diabetic nephropathy, the kidney size may be normal, it may sometimes even be increased. CT scans and MRIs are also quite useful. A renal biopsy should actually be performed in every person that has unexplained CKD 
No more sized kidneys unless there is a strong contraindication against the renal biopsy. If there is rapidly progressive lomerulonephritis, then the investigation must be performed within 24 hours of the presentation, if at all possible. How do we manage these patients? We want to treat any reversible cause. We want to treat any hypotension or any dehydration. We want to stop any administration of nephrotoxic drugs. We want to treat any urinary obstruction. We want to treat any BPs, severe BPs. Your goal is to drop your BP to less than 120 over 80. Treat any infections that are there. So in terms of the renal protection, we want to give them ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, because these are going to slow the progression of chronic renal failure. Remember that these drugs are not going to be used and should be avoided in patients with AKI, but we can use these drugs in patients with CKD. So we want to use them, especially in patients with CKD and proteinuria greater than one gram per day. So we want to add an ACE inhibitor, we increase it to the maximum dose, and still if it's not helping, we can add an angiotensin receptor blocker if the goals are not achieved, especially in patients in type 2 diabetics you want to start off with an angiotensin receptor antagonist first. Then you add a diuretic to prevent the hyperkalemia, because remember these drugs are going to retain potassium. And they help, and it's also going to help control the BP in terms of the diuretic. Then if this isn't working, you add a calcium channel blocker, verapamil or diltiazem. Your goal is to control the BP, because if you decrease the, the BP, this is going to decrease the progress of the chronic renal failure. So if they have proteinuria, you're aiming for somewhere around 125 over 75. If they don't have proteinuria, you're aiming for a BP that's somewhere around 130 to 85 or less than this. You want to start them on statins to reduce the cholesterol level to less than 4.5. Tell them to stop smoking because remember, there's a threefold risk of deterioration in chronic kidney disease in patients that smoke. You treat diabetes and ensure that the HbA1c is less than 7%. It should have a normal protein diet. There is no suggestive clinical evidence that dietary restriction of proteins will actually slow the progress of renal disease, so it's less clear. So give them 0.8 to 1 gram per kg body weight of proteins. Avoid any nephrotoxic drugs. Tetracyclines, which um, the only exception that I can think of is doxycycline. These are going to have an anti-anabolic effect and they'll tend to actually worsen uremia, so avoid them. Drugs that are excreted by the kidneys, like gentamicin, they should be only prescribed if the benefits are greatly outweighing the risk and there is no alternative that you can actually give. NSAIDs should be avoided. Potassium sparing agents like spironolactone, amyloride, because these are going to cause hyperkalemia. But doxolone is actually an antioxidant modulator that can be given and has been shown by some clinical trials to reduce the GFR, especially in diabetic CKD. Then you treat any complications. If there's hyperkalemia, you treat that. I've talked about hyperkalemia as a video on its own that you can actually check out in the emergency medicine playlist. So you restrict the potassium in the diet, stop any drugs that may cause hyperkalemia, protect the heart, give them your calcium gluconate, 10 mils of 10% over 10 minutes. This effect is temporal but can be repeated after 15 minutes. Push the potassium into the cells, so redistribute the potassium. 50 mils of 50% dextrose given with 10 international units of soluble insulin over 15 to 20 minutes. This is given 2 to 4 hourly as required. You monitor the serum glucose levels. You monitor the potassium levels every 2 to 4 hourly. You can nebulize them with salbutamol 10 to 20 milligrams or you can give 0.5 milligrams in 100 mils of 5% glucose over 15 minutes. This one though is rarely used in our diet and era. This um, day. Then you push the potassium out of the body. Give them frosamide, one milligram per kg, but make sure that the patient is hydrated and they're not dehydrated. Kyxalate or sodium rhizonium can be used. Um, you may sometimes consider hemodialysis if this patient is refractory. I've talked about this in detail in the management of hyperkalemia in its own lecture. In terms of hypertension, you want to perform salt restriction. Diuretics are very good. Loop diuretics are recommended. For patients that have hypertension and they have edema that is due to chronic renal failure. Thiazide could be added to the loop diuretics, especially for those that have refractory edema. Put them on some antihypertensive drug regimen. For those that have volume overload, dietary salt restriction and diuretic therapy, usually the loop diuretics. Those that have metabolic acidosis, you may consider maintaining the plasma bicarbonate concentration above 22, so you may consider giving them sodium bicarb as a daily dose of 0.5 to 1 mL equivalent per kg per day. Those that have hyperphosphatemia, you want to restrict the 
the, the, the remember the dietary restriction rather of the phosphate we actually limit the secondary hypothyroidism in patients with CKD so an intake of above 800 milligrams per day is desirable can actually even be accomplished only by limiting the protein intake though this has not shown significant um, improvement especially in the clinical trials for those that have anemia transfuse them with blood so you may also give them recombinant erythropoietin because erythropoietin is the problem your target here is to get their hb at least between 11 to 12 if they fail to respond maybe this is due to iron deficiency because remember hepcidin which is produced from the liver could sometimes be produced because this patient has a chronic illness they are producing a lot of this interleukin 6 remember that hepcidin is an acute phase reactant that sequesters away iron then they may sometimes be have a bleeding, they may have a malignancy that you should look for in infection, an inflammatory process, or they're forming these anti-erythropoietin anti neutralizing antibodies. So intravenous rather than oral supplementation of iron is actually used to optimize the response of erythropoietin treatment to replete the iron stores in these patients. For those that have malnutrition, low protein diet restrict the intake to about 0.8 to 1 gram per kg or high biological value protein intake those are the plant sources as opposed to animal sources so this level of protein restriction avoids malnutrition and may slow the progress of disease though clinical trials are not so convincing and then the overall diet of most patients that have chronic renal failure should actually be approximately about 30 to 35 kilocal rather kilocalories per kg per day if they have male erectile dysfunction testosterone deficiency should be corrected so oral phosphodiesterase inhibitors like sildenafil can actually be effective in end-stage kidney disease and are usually the first line of therapy. The use of nitrates is actually contraindicated. Then you also want to identify and adequately prepare these patients that need renal replacement therapy. Remember the indications of dialysis, the acidosis, electrolyte imbalances, fluid overload, intoxication, and of course over fluid overload statuses and uremia so you want to educate your patient you want to give them an informed choice on which renal replacement therapy they're going to be going for whether they're going to be chronically on hemodialysis and having sessions that are scheduled with them or they're going to undergo a kidney transplant all these have advantages and disadvantages in terms of a kidney transplant you have to wait for a donor that is compatible for these patients and then of course these issues of tissue rejection and you actually actually need to have surgeons that are going to operate sometimes this is quite expensive for patients and of course dialysis you have to schedule it each and every at, at scheduled intervals and of course sometimes there are some side effects that are associated with dialysis which is a topic for another day i really hope you enjoyed this video on chronic kidney disease if you did consider subscribing to the channel hit the bell notification icon to never miss on such amazing content every time i post to Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazebu. Until next time, bye-bye.